Kamala Harris gave a speech in Selma, Alabama. And people sort of ran with this. The media sort of ran with it. And they said, Kamala Harris is calling for a ceasefire. But is that what she did? Did she actually call for a ceasefire? Now, MSNBC actually came right out of the gate with it. They said Vice President Kamala Harris calls for an immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war during a speech in Selma, Alabama. Let's listen to the speech ourselves, and then we're going to dive into this whole gaslighting uh, story here from Kamala Harris, AOC, and Bernie Sanders. They're all gaslighting. Let's dive in. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire for at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. Okay, I think we all heard the same thing that I just heard, right? Okay, let's just hear it one more time just to make sure, because I'm going to show you how MSNBC is already lying with the headline. The immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. Yeah. Notice she paused there, right? I'll tell you why that happened. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. For at least the next six weeks, which is currently what is on the table. Mainstream media, Pundits, pundits for the Democratic Party, they're all writing these headlines that says Kamala Harris calls for an immediate ceasefire, which is exactly where she paused right after that, right? Then she went on to say at least for the next six weeks, which is actually on the table. This is no different from what Joe Biden already proposed. And I really want people to start paying attention. This was not Kamala Harris making some great effort here to call for something bolder than Joe Biden already called for. She's just repeating what Joe Biden already entertained and put on the table. So what they are actually calling for is a pause, a ceasefire, especially a permanent ceasefire. There is no pause. You just stop it all together. You stop the war altogether, right? So that's actually what she's calling for. But if you notice here, what MSNBC does and other outlets have done this as well, Vice President Kamala Harris calls for an immediate ceasefire and they stop it right there, right where she pauses and they leave out the part that she said for the next six weeks. What they should have said is that Kamala Harris calls for a temporary pause for the next six weeks in Gaza. Not that she calls for a ceasefire, but that's on purpose. And I'm going to tell you why I think they did that. Let's continue. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. This would allow us to build something more enduring to ensure Israel is secure and to respect the right of the Palestinian people to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. And given the immense scale. Okay. All right. So here's what I think is happening, folks. Brace yourselves. I really think this is the Democratic Party's way of trying to slide in Kamala Harris to replace Joe Biden. Because it wasn't just this speech and the attention that the speech received. They were trying to make it seem that, it's okay, Kamala is more further to the left than Joe Biden. And they paused it right there, which is right where she paused her speech. That's intentional. I really believe they are trying to go ahead and get people prepared for Kamala Harris to take that, that seat that spot from Joe Biden. And how do they do that? They make it appear to the younger people that she is further to the left than Joe Biden. 
and that she's calling for a ceasefire, which she's actually not. You heard the rest of that speech. They also had pictures. I'll see if I can find the picture. They had a picture of Kamala Harris walking across the bridge in Selma, Alabama. They did a photo op of that. Now, this gentleman here, he noticed it right off the bat. James Ray. She paused after there must be an immediate ceasefire before saying at least for the next six weeks, because she knows supporters of the administration can now clip it easily and disingenuously tell supporters of Palestinian liberation that the administration is pro ceasefire. One hundred percent. He got it. He gets it. He understands what's happening there. Now, even on the readout on MSNBC, of course, they're going with this. They're rolling with it. And this is what I was telling you guys. They're all a part of this. Shout out to Case Study QB for this clip. This is Kate, uh, Chris Van Halen, or Van Hollen, excuse me, uh, talking to Joy Reid here about Kamala's ceasefire. They're all, see, they all just went with that PR talking point. They all got the message. Today, Vice President Kamala Harris met with Bibi Netanyahu's biggest political rival, Israeli war cabinet official Benny Gantz, where they discussed the urgency of achieving a hostage deal. Harris reiterated the administration's standard line that Israel about Israel's right to defend itself. But now, why is Kamala Harris meeting with him instead of Joe Biden? Unless they're trying to go ahead and swoop Kamala in to that seat. Wouldn't the president meet with him? She expressed deep concern over the humanitarian situation in Gaza. The meeting comes one day after the vice president made this striking call for an immediate ceasefire while commemorating the bloody Sunday march where John Lewis and other voting rights act activists were beaten in Selma, Alabama in 1965. People in Gaza are starving. The conditions are inhumane. And our common humanity compels us to act. The threat of Hamas poses to the people of Israel must be eliminated. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. And by the way, guys, when she's giving the speech, she is on that bridge, okay? She's standing on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is in Selma, North Carolina. This is the bridge that civil rights activists and leaders have marched across before in the past. So you see what I mean? They're trying to signal something to the American people. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. Hamas claims it wants a ceasefire. Well, there is a deal on the table. And as we have said, Hamas needs to agree to that deal. And while her remarks are the most forceful that we've heard from anyone in the administration on the suffering in Gaza. And no, see how joy you see how guys, I hate to pause so quickly, but do you see how the PR, they all got the same PR talking points. She said Kamala Harris message is the most forceful. Kamala Harris said the same thing that Joe Biden said just a couple weeks ago, which is that there would be the temporary pause. So you see how they're trying to butter her up and they're trying to polish Kamala to make her look shiny and attractive towards you. This is not trying to say people ugly, but I'm just saying they're trying to make her appeal attractive towards particularly the younger people who are out there protesting so that they can get them on board with the possibility of a Kamala Harris as president instead of Joe Biden. The cheers from the crowd clearly reflected the popularity of that position among large parts of the Democratic base. Harris's call echoes the six week ceasefire president, the six week ceasefire that President Biden called for last week with both Biden and Harris putting the onus on Hamas to agree to it. And the vice president insisted today that she and the president have been aligned from the beginning. The strong rhetoric from the administration comes as the humanitarian situation is indeed worsening, with more than 30,500 people dead, according to Gaza officials, and the United Nations saying that famine is inevitable. Today, a Palestinian U.S. official accused Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war 
and the Palestinian Ministry of Information said that 16 children have died of malnutrition and dehydration. Joining me now is Senator Chris Van Holland of Maryland, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, who said recently that there was no excuse for the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Senator, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I, as you, and I'm sure lots of other people, watch these images of... Did the hair become more blonde? I'm so confused. Joy, hon, the hair, no. No, no, no. And I've had my hair blonde, blonder too, but Joy, that hair is not cutting it, hon. It is not cutting it. American sort of air balloons dropping food uh, on the beaches of Gaza and people, you know, cheering and running to get the balloons. And I watched it with sort of a combination of of happiness that they're getting food and also sort of heartbreak that that's what we're down to. What do you make of the fact that it does appear that Vice President Harris is taking the lead on a different tack, at least rhetorically? And there we can see the balloons. Um, and the, the administration seems to be shifting away from Netanyahu. Well, Joy, it's good to be with you. And I was pleased to hear the vice president uh, say what she said in strong terms. Uh, she was, of course, right to acknowledge Israel's right to defend itself uh, against Hamas. Uh, but she was also right to point out that 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 right does not extend to restricting humanitarian aid coming into Gaza. Let me pause here because let me tell you something about this poser, OK? You see, Chris Van Hollen, he talks a good game, but Chris Van Hollen voted. He gave a speech criticizing Israel. And right after he gave that speech, he voted to send more aid to Israel. He's full of it. All these people there, this is a game. This is a game they're playing with you. They will never take it to the extent to fully criticize Israel for Zionism because a lot of them are bought into Zionists as well. A lot of them are part of, of the Israeli lobby or they're in bed with the Israeli lobby. They will never take it to the extreme to tell you the ultimate problem with Israel. Kamala Harris still won't call it a genocide. Neither will AOC. And you're going to see that in just a second. And neither will Chris Van Hollen. These people are playing you. This is a ploy to try to get the protest to calm down, to get the younger voters to say, OK, I'm going to go ahead and support you guys after all. Now, this is nothing new. There was nothing that she said in that speech that was new compared to what we already heard a couple of weeks ago. But the media's role is to make you think it is new. The media's role is to make you think that it is bolder, it is stronger so that you can try to like Kamala. Uh, we now have at least 15 kids who have died of starvation. So there are hundreds of thousands who are on the verge of starvation, but now we have kids who have died of starvation. And like you, I was pleased to see uh, the president um, order the airdrops, uh, but that will only be a drop in the bucket given the need. Uh, the president has to demand, and he said there are no excuses, that the Netanyahu government open more of the crossings, that the Netanyahu government and the arbitrary restrictions on so much assistance trying to get into people of Gaza, and that the Netanyahu government make it safe to deliver uh, assistance because humanitarian aid workers have been killed uh, by Israeli forces in the process of trying to get food to starving people. So let me pause here. We're going to go to another clip, but there's something else I want to show you as well, because I'm telling you what they're trying to do in reference to Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris doesn't have a favorable approval rating either. You know, it's, it's not just Joe Biden uh, and neither does AOC. And we'll get to her in just a second as well. But I want to show you what the ultimate plan is here. When I say they're trying to polish Kamala and make her look attractive towards you, the same day that speech dropped, this picture was trending across uh, Twitter. This is Kamala Harris walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, what are they trying to tell us with this picture? They are trying to tell us, look, this bridge where several civil rights leaders and activists marched across, you know, during the 60s, 50s, etc., now we actually have a, a, a Asian slash black vice president, okay, walking across this bridge, but she's actually vice president. And she's able to do this because the activists paved the way for her to do so. Problem is Kamala Harris, she's no activist. 
Kamala Harris is a part of the status quo. Kamala Harris, how dare they try to portray her in a sense as though she's like a Malcolm X or Martin Luther King? She's not. And I would say that Martin Luther King is actually more on the weaker end when we talk about bold revolution. Malcolm X is more revolutionary than Martin Luther King was, I would say. Fred Hampton, probably more revolutionary than all of them when we talk about the Black Panthers. But this is what they try to do and how they try to portray her walking across this bridge. This is why I'm trying to tell you, they are trying to make it so that we will accept her. This is their way to promote Kamala Harris. And then there was this article that came out as well in reference to her speech, which says, um, excuse me, says the administration officials watered down Kamala Harris Gaza speech before delivery. So they're trying to get you here to think that she actually was going to say something more harsher, but they wanted to look at this before vice president Kamala Harris delivered pointed remarks Sunday about the need for an immediate six week ceasefire between Israel and Hamas as part of a deal to release hostages. Officials of the national security council toned down parts of her speech, three current U S officials and a former U S official familiar with the speech told NBC news, the original draft of Kamala Harris speech when it was sent to the national security council for review was harsher on Israel about the dire humanitarian situation in the Gaza strip and the need for more aid. than were the remarks she ultimately delivered. So, Notice how it said it was harsher against Israel about the humanitarian situation, not harsher against Israel about Israeli policy and them actually working against international law. Nothing about the settlements, nothing about them kicking Palestinians out of their home, none of, nothing about the rhetoric on the videos of the IDF calling Palestinians animals and savages, nothing about the ethnic cleansing remarks, nothing about that. Just the fact that we need to feed these people and let Israel still bomb them at the same damn time. Two, another thing that is revealing from this article, it tells you that the National Security Council toned down parts of her speech. Ladies and gentlemen, that just goes to show you that once again, the people that you think are in charge are not in charge. The vice president can't use her own speech that she supposedly wrote. The vice president can't make decisions. The president can't make decisions. Who's making all these damn decisions? You have the alphabet letter agencies making some of these decisions. You have billionaires making some of these decisions. You got the Clintons and the Obamas making some of these decisions. So this article, the way that I read it, some people might fall for that, but I'm looking at this article and I'm saying, oh, so you mean to tell me the vice president can't make their own decisions? Who's running the country? That's how I would look at it. Eric, we can go to the second part of tight VNC when you're ready. And we're going to move on to the AOC portion of the story as well, because Kamala Harris, the first gaslighter, and of course, all the media pundits got those talking points and they went with the same PR strategy to make it seem like Kamala is this next best thing. I don't think this is going to work the way that they think it's going to, but I really do feel like they're trying to slide her in to replace Joe Biden. Now, AOC, gaslighter number two. AOC was approached about the same situation as she was leaving a movie theater in Brooklyn. Protesters approached her asking her to call it genocide. Get a load of this, folks. Ay, ay, ay. You refuse to call it a genocide. No, I, I, I need you to understand that this is not okay. It's we not okay that there's a genocide happening. You're not actively against it. You're lying. I'm lying. You're you went on TV and avoided talking about it. You're lying. Stop it. 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 Stop we're not lying. We're not lying. You've been we're not lying. It's the same. You haven't been calling it a genocide. Don't tell me I'm lying. Oh. Then just say it's a genocide. Just say it. Over 30,000 people are dead, are dead, AOC. You can't just say it for once. Just say 
So they're just asking her to say it is a genocide. That's it. They're not asking her to protest with them. They're not asking her to do a demonstration. They're just asking her to admit that what's happening to the Palestinian people in Gaza is a genocide. Say a word. That's it. That's all we want you to say. Or you're not angry about people complaining in public when they can't start genocide all over the country because So first of all, miss, you're not helping them. You refuse to call that is completely out of context. I already said that it was. And y'all are just going to pretend that it wasn't over and over again. It's fucked up, man. If you you're not helping these people TV. and you're not helping them. You refuse to. You're not helping them. So according to AOC, she's telling the protesters and the activists that they're not helping the Palestinian people. So my question is this. Have you guys seen AOC at any of the pro-Palestinian protests or rallies? Because I sure as hell haven't. And I've attended those rallies. No? Was she at any of the DC pro-Palestinian rallies? What about all the ones that have been happening in her own city in New York just about every freaking weekend? Has she participated? Has she been a speaker at any of those rallies? I think if she had, you would have heard about it on social media, correct? Would you see a lot of the third party and independent candidates, Claudia De La Cruz, Cornel West, Jill Stein, they've spoken at those rallies. They've marched in those, those protests. But AOC is gaslighting her voters and the viewers by telling the protesters that they're the ones that are not helping the Palestinian people. Uh, no, AOC, that would be you. You're not helping them because you're out here telling people that you endorse Joe Biden, genocide Joe, who was responsible for giving the weapons and the aid to Israel in the first damn place so that they could commit the genocide of the Palestinian people. You don't have to tell them to vote for anyone. That's the other thing. You really don't have to endorse any damn body. If you didn't feel comfortable supporting Joe Biden, you could have just said, I plead the fifth. I'm staying out of this. I'm not endorsing anyone. You could have even done that. But no, you had to go as far as to endorse Joe Biden before the war in Gaza and you did it after the war in Gaza. You didn't have to say shit. I wouldn't have said anything. Or you could have gone a step further and you could have said to your supporters that whatever's left of them, you could have said, guys, I think it's time we need to move towards a third party movement. I think it's time that we got to get out of this duopoly and I'll be right there with you. You could have said that. Bernie Sanders could have said that. Neither one of you guys are going to say that because you are just now a part of the status quo as the very same people that you ran against. You may have ran against Joe Crowley, AOC, but you are now like Joe Crowley. But this is gaslighting when they sit here and they try to blame the protesters. She's done this before. When we had the marches for Medicare for All all across this country, AOC tried to blame the protesters, the activists. You guys got to organize on the outside. That's the only way people are going to hear you in Congress. So people are organizing on the outside. And she's criticizing people for organizing on the damn outside. There's just no justification for it. Now, she says in that video that she already said that it was. I already said that it was. And you guys are going to clip this and, 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 and you're going to make it be what you want it to be. Did she? Let's go back to this recent interview that she had with Meet the Press. I don't remember her saying that it was a genocide. But she was asked about it. About what's happening in the Middle East. There are details about this potential emerging deal in which Israel would stop 
uh, its war campaign for about two months in exchange for all of the hostages, given the argument by Israel, by the U.S. government, that applying pressure to Hamas was the only way to get the hostages out. Do you think that Israel's strategy on the point of the hostages has been effective? I do not. Um, we have seen, we know that Hamas as an organization, it, it, it does not have any regard for human life. I think that in Hamas's attack on October 7th, they knew what they were bringing on uh, to, to, they knew the, the, the violence that they were bringing on. And we have seen that. They understood the asymmetric attack that, that Israel will put out. Israel has been indiscriminately attacking uh, Gazans. And we have seen t over 25 thousand Palestinians have been killed, over 70 percent of whom are women and children. This the, using 25,000 lives mm -hmm. as leverage and the idea that that is going to pressure Hamas, they are accountable to very little. But I think what is most important is saving these lives, ensuring the release of hostages and, in my view, negotiating a ceasefire. You now, she just told you the number of people that have died. By the way, that number is now over 30,000 people, right, since this interview. The number will continue to increase as they find more people that are under the rubble, just FYI. But here's that part. Some of your colleagues, and we talked about what's happened at the, the protests this week, uh, have called the president Genocide Joe. Some of your colleagues have accused the president of supporting genocide, including Rashida Tlaib. Do you agree with that word? genocide that the president's been supporting a genocide or does that go too far there it is i think what we are seeing right now throughout the country is that young people are appalled at the violence and the indiscriminate loss of life we are not just seeing twenty-five thousand people that have died in gaza we are seeing the starvation of of millions of people, the displacement over, of over two million Gazans. We have South Africa that has mounted uh, a court in the ICJ. The ICJ ruled this week that Israel has a grave responsibility to prevent genocide. But they're still, they're that still that the determining that whether it's a genocide. Do you think that they term are still is determining given it. that it's still under investigation? I believe that they are, they're still determining it. But in the interim ruling, the fact that they said there's a responsibility to prevent it, the fact that this word is even in play, the fact that this word is even in our discourse, I think demonstrates the mass inhumanity that Gazans are facing. And so whether you are an individual that believes this is a genocide, which, by the way, in our polling, we are seeing large amounts of Americans concerned specifically with that word. So I don't think that it is something to completely uh, toss someone out of our public discourse uh, for using. But I think what we are seeing here is that the Netanyahu government has lost public support and that we have a responsibility to protect the human rights and the humanity of Gazans right. and hostages alike in the area. All right. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we really appreciate you continuing to gaslight the American people. So I wanted to show you that just to remind you that she did not call it a genocide. She has called for a ceasefire, but that's not what they were asking her to do. Now, if you notice in that video, she was very uncomfortable. She was just kind of like, stop asking me this. Don't get away. Just get, just get, get, go, go. Right. She didn't want them following her. You wanted to be a public, you know, official. AOC, you wanted to be a congressperson. People have the right to come to you with questions and people have the right to protest and people have the right for their protest to make you feel uncomfortable. Isn't that exactly what you once said? You see, if we go back to this tweet from AOC from December 2nd, 2020, the whole point of protesting is to make people uncomfortable. Activists take that discomfort with the status quo and advocate for concrete policy changes. Popular support often starts small and grows. To folks who complain, protest demands make others uncomfortable. That's the point. That's the point, AOC. And to use her own statement against her, 
That means AOC that people now see you as part of the status quo. That's why they're protesting against you. These aren't the people who voted against you. These are the people who actually supported you and believed in you. But it seems like you don't want to make yourself uncomfortable. They have a right to do that with everyone except for you. So that shows you just how far you've fallen. This gentleman here actually said, his name is D. AOC is my representative, Parkchester slash Soundview Bronx, about a dozen store owners who are Palestinian or at least from one side of the parent. I visited them months ago to check how they are doing. Many of them feel angry at AOC and this country for allowing the genocide to happen. But that's gaslighter number two. Now we go to the final gaslighter, and that is Bernie Sanders. Because Bernie Sanders is out here gaslighting for the American people as well. Again, part of the status quo. And I got to tell you, you know, Bernie Sanders need to stop doing interviews as well. Just stop. I, gotta, I mean, it seems like political pressure might be one thing to get the administration to take a more aggressive posture vis-a-vis -vis Netanyahu. And I wonder what you made of the results from the Michigan primary earlier this week. Over 100,000 people voting uncommitted as an effective protest vote against this administration. Well, policy. it tells me and I think it tells the White House that there are large numbers of young people, large numbers of minority people, large numbers of Americans who are sick and tired of the slaughter of the Palestinian people. And again, this is not some distant thing. This is with our tax dollars. Those guns and the planes largely or significantly are paid for by U.S. tax yes. dollars. So the word is, again, I mean, I, we cannot continue to support this right wing extremist government. No more money. We must demand a fundamental change of policy. Do you think that this could be an issue that could decide the 2020, if not t entirely, you think this could be a deciding factor in the election? Well, I mean, people have got to know that, you know, Trump is, you know, even more pro-Israel than, than Biden has been. But I think what you're going to see is a lot of young people, mm -hmm. uh, people of color, uh, people of Arab descent saying, you know what, uh, I don't like Trump, but I just I'm not going to come out and vote. So it could be decisive in that in that sense. Orange man bad. Now he just gave you a list of things that are problematic that's happening in Gaza. Not all of them still didn't go far enough. Still won't say genocide just like AOC and Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders won't even call for a ceasefire till this day. Right. But he did say we got to stop sending the aid, etc. So let me just break something down for you folks. Notice there at the end how he said that, well, Trump's even more pro Israel than Joe Biden. So essentially what Bernie Sanders is asking the American people, the younger voters, do you want a little bit of genocide or do you want a lot of genocide? How about we don't want any genocide, Bernie? So he's still trying to use Donald Trump derangement syndrome to get the young voters to come out and to get people to still continue to support Joe Biden. We all know what Joe Biden is doing. We all know that the weapons that are going to Israel coming from this country in particular has actually aided that genocide. And had it not been for the weapons and support from the United States government, Israel would have not been able to kill all the Palestinian people that they have killed today. Never forget that. So these people, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, AOC, these people are gaslighters. And what they do every now and then, they pop up, whether it's an interview or whether it's a tweet that they have, they pop up every now and then and they'll say a little bit of something to make it seem like they're on the right side of history and that they actually agree with some of the progressive values or even socialist values. But at the end of the day, they're trying to have two feet in two separate places. So they're trying to have their left foot on one side and their right foot on the other side. And sometimes you can't straddle the line. Sometimes you have to pick a side. And it's very telling that when it comes to the state of Israel, because so many of our Congress members are in bed with the Israeli lobby and they've taken money from the Israeli lobby, they don't want to rock that boat. Notice how easy they can call out Netanyahu and say right wing extremist. That's easy for them to do. It's more difficult for them to call out Zionism as a whole. Without Zionism, you don't get a Netanyahu. Never forget that. So they appear 
to make it seem like Joe Biden is moving further to the left. He is not. This is all a game. And they are gaslighting you. They're gaslighting the protesters. They're gaslighting taxpayers. They're gaslighting anybody who sees what Israel is doing and they should be ashamed of themselves. If you live in AOC's district, I highly recommend that you run against her. But when you run against her, don't run against her as a Democrat or Republican. You need to run against her as an independent. Somebody needs to challenge AOC. Jose is challenging Richie Torres. Somebody needs to challenge AOC because her ass needs to be broke. And when I say that, that's not a physical thing. What I'm saying is her spirit needs to be broken. She needs to go. She's got to get out of Congress because she has become very, I feel, ah, oh, what's the word? I feel she's become very entitled and she feels like she deserves to be there just because when she's not delivering on the promises that she made to people in her district, to her constituents. She won't talk to pro protesters now, but she can walk up in the Met Gala and parade around with a dress on and take pictures like she's a celebrity, but she ignores all of you guys. Years ago, she would have been out in the streets with you. Now she's against you. So pay attention. All these people need to be shaken up. Whether that's Bernie Sanders, AOC, come all these people got to go. In a political way, these people have got to go because they're not making things better for us. You know what's making, what's getting our voices heard? It's the people in the streets. It's not AOC. It's not Bernie. It's not Kamala. None of them have been at these protests. None of them. None of them have supported them. None of them have shared these protests. All they've done is worry about themselves and their political careers. So don't let the gaslighters continue gaslighting, okay?